dissipated. By Tuesday, there are over 6,000 British troops in Dublin. Isolated at the Viceregal Lodge in Phoenix Park, the Viceroy Lord Wimborne is in a state of panic. Convinced by intelligence reports that the Germans are behind the rebellion and that worse is to come, he declares martial law in Dublin for the first time in a hundred years. He appeals to Prime Minister Herbert Asquith in London for immediate military support. The initial response is surprisingly muted. Asquith was down in his country house that Easter weekend. And when he came back to 10 Downing Street, somebody told him as he went in that there'd been a rising in Dublin, buildings had been occupied, and all hell had broken loose. And Asquith just turned around and said, well, that's something, and went to bed. And there's a certain sense in which that encapsulates Ireland's inability to command British attention because of the Great War. Earlier in the day, the Germans launched Zeppelin raids on English cities in Kent and Essex, while their battleships bombard towns on England's coast. It takes time for events in Dublin to capture Asquith's attention. But when Britain's response finally comes, it is massive and resolute. Late on Tuesday night, thousands of soldiers arrive at Liverpool docks and board ship bound for Ireland. Britain's military might is about to be directed on Dublin. We arrived in Kingston. It was five minutes past five in the morning by the clock at Kingston Harbour when we got there. By dawn on Wednesday, thousands of British soldiers have landed at South Dublin's Kingston Harbour. Among them are two battalions of Sherwood Foresters, young infantrymen, so raw they have to be shown how to load and fire their guns on the pier. Some think they've even arrived at the Western Front. Half the Sherwood Foresters are getting to the city centre, unmolested, they talk about kind of the locals cheering them, cups of tea, have all these stories of the truth being welcomed. Everywhere we went, we could have had 10 breakfasts a day if we'd have wished. Honestly, the Irish people then couldn't have treated us better for to be in own. For the Sherwood Foresters who are going to go up um, the coast road and through the Bulls Bridge route, it's going to be a disaster. The rebel garrison at Boland's Mill is positioned to defend against reinforcements arriving by road and rail to Beggar's Bush Barracks. Its commander, Eamon de Valera, a mathematics teacher, has set up outposts covering Mount Street Bridge and Northumberland Road. By Wednesday, we knew that number 25 was being held by only two men, Michael Malone and Jim Grace. It's a horrible vignette of urban fighting to think of Mick Malone and Jimmy Grace going into number 25, going up the stairs. They found this little bathroom at the back with a window looking out down Northumberland Road, and they knew this was the position. Around about one o'clock in the day, we heard the noise of marching men and looked out, and here we saw, as we thought, the whole British army coming in. And they were marching along quite unconcerned. And the men in number 25 waited until they got to the junction of Haddington Road and Northumberland Road. When they came under fire, it was complete chaos. Clearly, nobody knew what to do. A lot of soldiers were killed on the spot, and they had no idea where the firing was coming from. The sound echoes across all the surrounding buildings. You just can't tell where it's coming from. Well, we thought there were probably two or three hundred. Their fire was so good and so accurate that they misled the troops as to the numbers. From their outpost at Clan William House on the far side of the canal, the rebels will have any soldiers who reach Mount Street Bridge in range. When they came in our view, then we opened fire. 
They charged about seven or eight at a time across the bridge. But they never crossed the bridge. There was a discussion between the Sheriff Forces Command and Lowe, who's in the castle. We're coming under heavy fire, what should we do? And Lowe just repeats the idea, you take those positions no matter what. Again and again, this mad attempt was made until the bridge was heaped with dead and wounded. This gave me the impression of a giant human khaki colored caterpillar. Eventually, the British traced the sniper fire on Northumberland Road to the upper floor window of number 25. It would have been between half past six and seven. It was still bright when they made an almighty rush. And they got up the steps and they threw a bomb at the door and we heard an explosion and we saw a bright light and we knew it was the end of those two. As soldiers force their way into number 25, Jimmy Grace escapes out the back, but Mick Malone is shot dead. The second outpost, Clan William House, is reduced to a blazing shell and finally abandoned by the rebels. In the end, 230 British soldiers are dead or wounded. The rebels lose just four men. By now, four 18-pound field guns stationed by the British at Trinity College have begun shelling the city. The next thing was the Helga arrived and shelled Liberty Hall. <laughs> 